prayer. Does it work? I mean, many try it, but does it actually work? I was with a group of ex-soldiers recently, they'd served, men had served in distinction, and uh, we were talking a bit about Jesus, the way you do, and one was describing how he'd had a bit of a battle with senior ranks, because when he joined up, they'd put down that he was C of E, and he really wanted to be down as an atheist. Now, I think others were kind of sympathetic, because as it developed, they agreed with him, and then slightly became conscious a bit of my presence again, perhaps. Either that, or they'd said all they wanted to do were looking for the next topic of conversation. Well, I heard myself saying a little pause, but there's not many atheists in a scrape. I don't think they were just humouring the rev in the room when a short pause again was followed with sounds of quiet agreement. But I have to say, if God wasn't the God who actually does answer prayer in a scrape or elsewhere, I strongly suspect I'd still be the atheist I was raised to be. He does answer prayer, but he isn't a slot machine. And John's clearly making a point about this in our passage today in John 5, 13 to 15. Now, the point of what John is saying is this. It's in verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. John's used lots of non-literal illustrative language in his book so far and just as at the end of this gospel he now explicitly states and he clarifies the point that he is actually trying to make by all of this. The overriding point of his book he is saying so that those who believe in the name of the Son of God, and we'd be going through what believing in the name of the Son of God, God amounts to throughout the book so far, so that those people may know that they have eternal life. John has gone round and round, reiterating and developing the tests of faith, this believing in the name of the Son of God of which he speaks. Those tests, or rather authentication factors, have been the faith fruits of love, faithful obedience to the God who speaks in his word, and sound doctrine. And the acronym OLD, O-L-D, spells out obedience, love, and doctrine. So if you have those features growing in you, they are affirming signs of biblical faith. And if you have that biblical faith, you most assuredly do have eternal life. These are the fruits of faith, and faith brings assurance of eternal life. Now let's face it. In a world, in a church world, full of fine-sounding falsehood, seducing sin and the compelling confusion of compassion. The fruits of faith can get fatally squashed in the very aisles of the supermarket before they ever get home. The world around us squishes the fruit of faith, almost in the bud, and we need to know and recognise what it is that goes on. Losing the assurance of faith accompanies failure to fortify our faith. And that happens both at the rational ideas and subjective feelings level. There is objective assurance that identifies the evidence, forensically as it were, that matches the descriptions in the word of God and attests that our faith is real because this we have here matches that there. It identifies and analyzes signs of faith in the decisions and the choices that we make in terms of choosing to trust God, acting to love as and because he loves us, Choosing God's revealed truth from his word over error in our decision making and so on. And then having conducted this analysis, it concludes rationally that those are the features of the life of true faith that indicate reliably that eternal life lies there. Objective assurance. Then there's a more subjective assurance, insecure of course, without the presence of the more tangible fruits of faith, which is really important nonetheless for motivating us in a warm walk with God. What am I talking about? Humanity, as created by God, is not just a collection of brains on sticks. Our rational faculties are really crucial. But if we want to get people walking with God, we pick up his word, the Bible, and what we do with it is that we inform the mind in such a way as to move the heart to motivate the will. That's not my way of putting it. I heard it from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones's formulation of the situation. But it illustrates the importance for a walk with God of hearing truth, warmed and directed towards the will of the believer. If you want people informed, and we do, we must address the mind with a sound doctrine of God's word, yes. But we do it to move the heart. Because there lies the passion which then moves the will to act in the truth of God's word. And if we do not feed faith so that its fruits come to light, then the assurance of faith isn't going to warm and comfort our hearts in a way that moves the will. If we don't move the will, 
Where's the walk? The walk away from the broad road that leads to destruction, towards the narrow gate and the way that leads to life. Without a moved heart, where's that going to come from? Look, our Christian assurance isn't simply a comforting thing that makes us feel better. Firstly, it is something based in observable, much more objective realities than that. Things that you can see in a life as the fruit that God causes to grow on the tree of the, the faith he's given us, which, which demonstrates we've been born again and his spirit is at work changing our hearts. It isn't simply a comforting thing that makes us feel better, this assurance. It's observable. And secondly, recognising that makes us feel assured subjectively, as it were. And that subjective emotional response and encouragement motivates our human will to want God's will in our lives and to personally work to cooperate with the indwelling Holy Spirit to love and to serve our God more. But thirdly, and this cuts close to John's purpose in this particular context in 1 John, this assurance in the genuine helps us to discern the true from the false in the field of faith. Because we know the true, have seen it, recognise it from the way in which God is himself assuredly at work in our own hearts, as we recognise by our own personal experience of growth in obedience, love and sound doctrine, having had those things in ourselves, we recognise those things elsewhere, which authenticate a genuine faith. It helps us to discern the true from the false. And that's really John's biggest point as he writes this book. Please bear in mind, John writes these verses to people who are being caused confusion by the false faith of the false teachers that John is warning them about here. Can you see how important that genuine Christian assurance is? Not presumption, but evidence-based assurance to living by faith and persevering in a hostile world along the Christian way. John is in these verses identifying this assurance of which he speaks as the main purpose of his book. And the main thing that needs to be safeguarded in situations where false teaching and its fake behaviour trouble the church. And if you and I are the authentic Christians that John has been describing, we need to keep hold of our confidence that we have eternal life. It bears thinking about. Well, that's verse 13, but John moves on to describe the faithful fruit of this assurance. This is the confidence. So he's talking about the assurance and now he moves on. He says, well, this is it. Then this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's 1 John 5, 14. I'm just telling you the reference to that verse so you know it's actually what it says in the Bible. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that is, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. As believers, we spend so much time verbally confessing this truth that God hears our prayers, but actually perhaps not staking our life on believing it. Now, you'll be delighted to know, I'm sure, there's a bit of Greek going on in the background here. It's for the third time in chapter 5, verses 9 to 14, that bigger section. The author uses the construction, haute estin. It's in verse 9, verse 11, verse 14. Here, as in the previous instance, in 1 John 5, 11, the haughty clause, which follows, is an explanation is exegetical. It means explanatory to the pronoun aute and explains what the confidence consists of, which means to say we should translate something like this to convey what John is saying. And the confidence which we have before him is this, namely, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. John is pinning it right to that. The confidence we have before him is this, namely, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So first of all, we have confidence in approaching God. Now, these false teachers are, of course, and we're trying to set this in the context all the time, they are pressurising those believers in the small gatherings in homes round the edges of the city of Ephesus. It, it's the false teachers that are the problem that these believers are having to deal with face to face. And these believers quite probably feel a bit on the back foot in dealing with the confrontation. After all, if they were handling it just fine, why would John be needing to write to them like this? No, they're feeling that confrontation. John wouldn't need to write to them like this otherwise, but he has written to them like this about their assurance. And he really seems to have put a lot of thought and hard work into what he's doing. So there's clearly something going on. We're not picking up perhaps that they are, they are having trouble dealing with. 
But significantly, John doesn't address the confidence they should have in approaching the false teachers and the troublers of the churches to sort them out. No, on the contrary, John deals with the confidence that we have as genuine, if struggling believers, to approach God. Now, there's a lesson here. If I can put this reverently, we do have responsibilities to do certain things when confronted with these pressures being brought to bear on the church. But actually, it really is his church and therefore his problem to deal with. Be assured that God will hear and answer your prayers about this, says John. And then secondly, of course, this does indicate the way we should approach the things we need to do about false teachers who are troubling the church and peddling a faith fake, fake faith in Christ in this manner. Let's, let's go to Timothy for a minute, because there, there Paul is advising and, and counselling a young man. He's given a responsible job to in a church a way off. And in 2 Timothy 2, verses 23 to 25, Paul writes this to Timothy. As you're dealing with the problems over there, he says, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Because you know they produce quarrels. Well, there's something to think about in that sort of situation. People are false doctrine, putting false doctrine in the church and troubling the church. No, 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 says Paul. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. You know they just produce quarrels. And then John, and then um, Paul goes on. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed. And we're all for confrontation, aren't we? You know, they're troubling the church, they're causing they're talking nonsense and leading people astray. No, no. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. <clears throat> we should not in our hearts be thinking that what we need to do is simply trying to beat the false teachers in argument and show them up. Or even, as we might say, put them right on a thing or two. Not at all. We're seeking to use the means of grace, by which I'm referring to prayer and the ministry of the word of God, to bring about the Lord's primary gospel aim. What's that? That God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. That's the background context to what's going on here in 1 John 5 and verse 14, when it says, And the confidence which we have before him is this, namely, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That prayer is in the context of dealing with troublers of the church and of God's people. Now that doesn't mean it's all it's limited to, but that is the context. So what about the promise in this verse? What exactly is God promising here? This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. What is his will in 1 John? That his people would be equipped and motivated to recognise and to walk consistently with those three, as it were, authenticating legs on the stool of genuine Christian faith that leads to life, that makes the stool stand up. The three authenticating features of genuine, authentic Christian faith, the faith that leads to life. Firstly, obedience to God, love for the Lord and the people he set his heart on in the gospel, and sound doctrine the truth that sets individuals amongst mankind free. You'll know the truth, says Jesus, and the truth will set you free. So whatever we ask in harmony with those overarching principles in 1 John of what God's will for humanity is, asking according to these big gospel principles and applying them correctly to the things that we see before us, he hears us. Now, did you get that? Did it sink in? He hears us. So is prayer like a slot machine then? Verse 15. You know what a slot machine is, don't you? It's one of those gambling things you get at the seaside and in motorway service stations where you put some money in a slot, pull a handle, the machine spins some dials and it takes most of the money you put in it. Occasionally spits a bit of money back out at you. Which is fine so long as you quit while you're ahead and don't push your luck too much. Or so they say. Well, funnily enough, People can fall into the trap of thinking that prayer is a matter of saying your prayer and the result, automatically dropping out the rear end of the process, is an answer. Well, no, it isn't. It isn't like that. Consider the text. What the text here is saying is this in verse 15. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. This knowing that he hears us 
gets picked up again, you see, from verse 15. There's a, there's a link in the words that he used. It's linking verse 15 back to verse 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Oh, hello. See, this thing about him hearing us is the confidence the authentic Christian believer has in approaching God because that person, asking anything according to God's will, gets heard by God. Now, we can leave aside that I hear you in our society is often used to just deflect something we disagree with or don't want to hear at all. and means I, I, I can hear what you're saying, but no chance. The context rules that out here because in verse 15, that first if there is not talking about a situation that's in doubt. It's a definite situation. Now, I can talk about first and second class conditions and so on, but that promised answer of prayer comes in the context of an authentic and consistent Christian life that seeks first God's will and prays accordingly. Of course, there's much more that can be said about how that applies to a huge range of situations we might encounter, but the main thing is this. You need to pay attention to the totality of what John is saying here. Otherwise, you end up with this put your penny in the slot, pull the handle and get your money out of the bottom sort of approach to prayer and faith. But even with a slot machine, the preconditions, that is, when it pays out and how much, is preconditioned by the man who comes round, sets the machine up inside to pay out as set amounts, set intervals and so on, and takes the money away in his canvas bag. He always takes it away more than he brings it in. You'll have noticed that, perhaps. Consider the preconditions. The preconditions of this promise to faithful prayer, we have what we ask, relate to, firstly, authentic believers praying as John has defined them. See verse 13. Those people praying in accordance with his will, as John has thoroughly defined that in the five previous chapters. See verse 14. And then praying without doubting as they exercise confident, assured faith in the God they relate to personally as they pray. See verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, well, that's talking about people who are confident then, isn't it? Doing the praying. This is not about any Tom, Dick or Harry, apologies to Thomas, Richard and Harold, bowling up to God and reeling off their shopping list as if that's going to work the magic. Line up the matching symbols on the slot machine and send the coins clattering down the chute. John has spent five chapters and three careful verses in the immediate cotext, describing and setting out the sort of ongoing, specifically biblically Christian context in which the promise he then finally sets out holds true. Logically, of course, it would hold true. So now we can consider this tremendous promise itself in the second part of verse 15. Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. So, being in a both righted and right relationship with God, prayer is relationship, not automatic slot machine, aligning yourself with his will so thoroughly that in praying you're asking according to and in harmony with his revealed will walking with him heart to heart not simply putting your hand out to him when you want something his will not mine is the situation and then placing full confident assured trust in his ability and willing delight to answer your prayer asking not doubting in those conditions whatever we ask we know that we have what we asked of him no limits none so let me ask you Are you sure? John is writing to these people whose problems seem so real, but whose problems the Lord will delight to step in and solve. If they turn to him in the context of the sort of life of realistic faith that John's been describing, and John is saying anything. No limits in this situation. Under these atmospheric conditions, anything is possible. Right? Are you sure? James writes in James 1, 2 to 8, to a bunch of believers similarly up against distressing high pressure, almost impossible challenges. Explaining this a bit, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. We think they were facing persecution. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now get this bit because it seems to be very important. James 1, 6. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. 
are you, as we might say, in deep at the moment? It's a bit unsettling. Up to your neck in some challenging issue or situation. Ask. James says, ask because without favouritism, and favouritism was just one of the problems amongst the congregations James was writing to. Without favouritism, God gives generously to all his people without finding fault. But, there's a but, do not ask doubtingly. Such a sort of asking doubtingly reveals instability. Drifting in and out of faith and drifting in and out of trusting God isn't trusting God. That person, says James, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. What? Verse 7. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. As Hebrews 11, 1 to 2 puts it. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. How even nearly there yet, near to the confident assurance to rest all on God as we walk faithfully with him, as John has already described things to us. If so, that assurance is a powerful thing in the hand of God, who graciously hears and answers the prayers of such people, his people. Let's come to a conclusion. There seem to be too many people around in our era treating our gracious God, our friendship, loyalty and warm relationship seeking God. Treating him like the big celestial cookie monster handing out the goodies. As if he were almost a cuddlier version of some great celestial slot machine. Now some of that is no doubt self-indulgent, telling people what their itching ears are longing to hear to please people, to whip up excitement, to appeal to the masses and to be the big guy. Some of it sadly seems to be to exploit people by promising stuff to donations that fund a ministry, so-called, which actually looks more of a lifestyle for a preacher. But none of it is biblical or honouring to the God who speaks in his word. What honours him is the grace, mercy and covenant love that he is going to demonstrate to the genuine faith and life of the child of God. What honours him is the assured and faithful prayer that leads to the direct divine intervention. His response of evident and visible love to hard-pressed but utterly dependent faith. This thing that we call an answer to prayer. So to get back to where we started from then, does prayer work? <laughs> yes, yes it does. It works when God works. And he works to answer the prayers of people perfused with gospel life, living by his word in his spirit. And John's purpose in reiterating this is to boost the confidence and assurance of the people in these little house churches around Ephesus 2,000 years ago. They've been thrown into a bit of a turmoil by false teachers and fake livers out of what they purport to be Christian faith and life. And the need of those believers is assurance and to go confidently to God for him to resolve their problems. And let's face it, there are plenty of those false teachers and fake livers out around here here and now, to distract us too. And so, my friends, we have lessons here to learn, and John stands ready to teach us. <laughs>